I'm Zon, Head of Communications of Chat, and also the MC of today's event. So what is Textile Series? Textile Series is a platform to promote interdisciplinary discussion related to textile art and culture from diverse angles. Since the inaugural in 2016, this year is the third edition. So to begin today's event, I will pass the time to our co-directors, Chin Chin and Mizuki, to give an opening remark. Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming this Sunday morning to listen to our esteemed speakers for the Textile Series 3.2 discussion forum. Uh, before we start, I'd like to give a short introduction about CHAT and the Mills Project. Um, the hall you're sitting in today is called a Fabrica Atrium. The Mills Project is a project that was born in the year of 2014 when these three textile mills were discovered um, by our founders as uh, derelict warehouses. And there was a very conscious effort um, to conserve them, even though they did not make a lot of economic sense per se, but there was a lot of cultural and heritage value in repurposing these sites and making them relevant again for contemporary audiences and re-engaging everyone's uh, imagination and creativity in this space. So the Mills project consists of three pillars. The first uh, pillar is uh, CHAT, which is the Center for Heritage Arts and Textile, CHAT for short. And we are the um, nonprofit art and cultural organization that hosts uh, different exhibitions. So after this uh, discussion forum, if you have time, please uh, also have a walk in our um, exhibition galleries downstairs in the Mill 6 building. We are showing, uh, archiving the Mills through the lens, which is the photography exhibition show of five uh, artist photographers. And separate to chat, there's also Fabrica, which is um, the building that you're sitting in. This is a business incubator that is um, a space and a co-working space that is to encourage the young creatives in Hong Kong who want to make their um, ideas and into pr uh, practice and actually uh, real businesses uh, with the help of um, our incubating um, group. And Karine is at the end of the room. So maybe Karine, you can wave and say hello. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, there's an experiential um, shop front, which I think you will all get to walk around when, if you have time today. Uh, we try to bring also uh, different kind of uh, new retail experiences that showcase not just only products, but uh, always engaging the visitor in the uh, making process. So entering the shop as a consumer, um, you also are not only a consumer, but actually understand um, how many products are made. Um, so with that, I would like to hand over to my co-director, uh, Mizuki Takahashi, who will uh, introduce the symposium. Hello. Um, thinking about the, um, the history which this Mills building uh, have had, and um, we decided to set the themes at Textile Legacies and Now and the Future to discuss why we have to preserve the, uh, the heritage, what we have to narrate to the next generation. And uh, yesterday's symposium, uh, that we invited the one speaker, and the keynote speaker, and the three panelists, and uh, asking them to introduce their, uh, the issue they are handling with in preservations, and um, uh, growing up the next successors to, um, to pass over the textile technique and the technology to next generations. And the one of the biggest keywords which uh, we learned yesterday is a, um, a, a collaboration. So the many speakers actually collaborating with the uh, young designer, the musicians, and uh, as well as the big uh, European fashion brand to survive and also the um, uh, to tell their technology and the beauty of the textile and also the, um, um, spread out their legacy to the wider audiences. So today's uh, the symposium we are expecting to uh, listen to the more socio-political agendas uh, which the institutions and artists are facing with through their um, exhibitions and uh, also the art, uh, art production process. So then, then I, uh, the, I also need to 
uh, your cooperation to make uh, this forum more exciting. There is just small stickers and uh, on the mushroom table behind of you. And uh, during the tea break, please contribute to give the, uh, your questions or comment on this paper and attach the whiteboard, uh, which is an, uh, the whiteboard is located on uh, uh, the behind of you. So the, our moderator is going to pick up the, some of the questions to, um, to moderate the, the uh, Q&A session at the end of this day. So yeah, hope you enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Mizuki. Okay, so now we will begin section four to discuss how to narrate textile legacies. We're very excited to invite Ms. Joanna Engman, curator and industrial heritage coordinator of Textile Museum of Sweden in Boras, as well as Ms. Antonia Syme, director of Australian Tapestry Workshop in Melbourne, to share the very unique experience with us. The first presentation will be delivered by Joanna, who curated the permanent exhibition Textile Power at the Textile Museum of Sweden, which presented an overview of the textile industry on both local and global levels. This exhibition won the Exhibition of the Year 2016 award, the most prestigious prize an exhibition can be received in Sweden. Let's hear more from Joanna. Joanna, please. Okay, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, really impressed by chat and the mills, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm from the Textile Museum of Sweden. It's located in a city called Borås. Uh, I work as a curator and heritage coordinator. Um, many of the other speakers uh, from yesterday, for example, have talked a lot about uh, textiles and textile craft in different ways. Uh, my presentation will give you a slightly different angle uh, to our common theme here. Um, in my work, you see, I, I focus on heritage issues uh, connected to the large-scale textile industry. From industrialization uh, till today, really. Um, I'm not an expert in textiles. Uh, I focus more on uh, factory buildings, stories of workers, um, and that sort of thing. I also work with urban development uh, from a heritage point of view. In my presentation, I will tell you something about how the Textile Museum uh, has gone about to convey the textile industri industrial heritage, and I will do that by taking you through our uh, permanent exhibition uh, on this theme. I know some of you have actually been to Boros, but most of you probably haven't. Uh, so I will tell you something about um, uh, what we do at, at our museum, short introduction. Um, our archives and exhibitions um, focus on a broad variation of textiles, from heritage to smart textiles, from history to present, really. We take in art, craft, design, fashion, and industrial heritage. A big part of our work uh, is connected to our collections. We have about 30,000 uh, textile items, uh, with around uh, 400 textile machines, and a whole lot of textile-related items as well. Just like most museums, we have uh, permanent exhibitions as well as temporary. Uh, this picture is from the opening of uh, uh, the uh, Iris van Herpen uh, exhibition in, in 2014. Um, coming up very soon now is an exhibition about uh, Cristobal uh, Balenciaga. Uh, produced by uh, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Uh, and it will focus on his revolutionary designs from the 50s and 60s. So all of you who are in uh, Boros on Saturday are, of course, very welcome to come to the opening. 
the museum has a feeling of energy, bright colours, uh, playfulness over it, really. And um, we've got a lot of uh, activities, so a DIY area where people can play about uh, and try their creativity. Um, for example, we have a big try-on wardrobe, which is very popular, uh, where people can, uh, can play about, as you can see. Uh, and during a visit, we want people to interact, react, um, get involved, be enlightened, um, and to be creative. So that's an essence in our concept, really. We moved the museum to a new location about five years ago. Uh, since then, we share the same building as many other um, businesses and companies and, and uh, uh, institutions, all with textiles in common. Uh, the Swedish School of Textiles is in this building as well. Uh, we have a lot of collaboration with them. Um, and this hotspot for textiles is called the Textile Fashion Centre. It's located in former textile mills, and um, we have a lot in common with uh, chat and the mills, as you probably can see there. Uh, this photo is from the 40s, when the factory expanded quite a lot. And these former textile industry buildings used to be close behind fences like this, say, eight to ten years ago. Um, but... Um, yeah, they had quite an abandoned feeling to them, really, just like the mills had before. Um, and a property developer took on the challenge to transform uh, this from a sort of backyard feeling to high class, I suppose. Uh, and um, from the pictures I've seen from the transformation of, of, uh, of this building, we have so much in common, really. <laughs> um, since it became the Textile Fashion Centre, uh, now five years ago, uh, this place is now buzzing with students, researchers, entrepreneurs, uh, and all sorts of people who, who love textiles. Borås isn't probably the middle of Earth, <laughs> I suppose. It's a bit remote. Uh, I'll put it on the map, uh, put it out on the map for you. Um, it's uh, up in North in Europe, you find Sweden there. And if we zoom in, uh, you find Borås right there. So it's in the southern parts of Sweden. And it's the textile, uh, textile center of Sweden, just like Tilburg is in, in uh, the Netherlands, for example. Um, and it has a, a long tradition of, of crafts in the area of, of Borås uh, to bring an extra in income to agriculture, really. So since medieval time, the craft of making textiles have been organized in a system where merchandisers have, been, have supplied thread to weavers who in their homes have turned it into fabric. Uh, they then, then returned it to, mer to the merchandiser who then could make fortunes out of selling it on. Uh, and this meant that when industrialization finally made its breakthrough in Sweden quite late, uh, mid-19th uh, century, um, the preconditions to succeed were quite good. Because the, the workers uh, around in the area had, had the feeling for the craft and for good quality textile, but the, and the merchandisers had the money to invest in, in, in uh, industry. And uh, textile industry be became very successful uh, and came to build welfare in this area. Uh, you might not uh, think of Sweden as, as being a poor country, but it used to be. <laughs> and uh, in, in quite a, a short period of time, um, industries like this built the welfare and, and made Sweden one of the top welfare states in, in quite a short period of time. Um, and the textile industry in this part of, of uh, the country was really important in that. Our 
after the Second World War, but the garment industry um, expanded dramatically. A vast number of seamstresses were required in order to satisfy demand. Uh, we had a huge influx of foreign labor that made an ever-growing um, production possible. Competition from abroad increased, though, and by the 1970s, it was no longer profitable to produce in Sweden. And even though this meant a true crisis uh, for the region, for, you know, it's a hard blow to the jobs, to, to, um, to companies and to the identity of the place, really. Um, the textile industry still stands, stands strong today. It's not at all what it was in the 1970s, of course. Uh, but it has found new ways and, and uh, still lives on, j just like it does here in Hong Kong, doesn't it? Yeah. Today, research, science and development are the big driving forces uh, of Burros, alongside fashion design, for example. So, back to the Textile Museum. Uh, in 2016, I led, I led the project of producing the museum's permanent exhibition about textile industry, from concept to award-winning dis display. Uh, the history and development of the textile industry uh, of the Barros area was, of course, something that we decided to build our storyline on. Even though um, there is a lot to be told about our local history, uh, me and my team found that we just couldn't be, s you know, de deal with this subject in a serious way uh, without looking into the real reality of mass production of today in a global sense. Uh, the textiles that surround us today are not very likely to be produced in Sweden, and especially not the clothes we wear. And we decided to make this a, uh, a narrative advantage. The parallels between our local development and mass production globally uh, are striking, actually. So by using here and then, as in the local perspective, and there and now in the global perspective, we could make past and present sit next to each other just like that. Um, we also realized that these parallels made it easier for, for our visitors to uh, relate both to history as not being that long ago, uh, but also understanding that the poor conditions of the past is still something uh, of a re reality today, but exported to other places. It was also completely obvious to us that both light and dark sides had to be told. The textile industry has built welfare, but it's also an industry associated with low wages, um, bad working condition, environmental problems, and more. Sustainability, the lack of it and what to do about it, plays an important part in the exhibition. The excessive consumption of clothes in the rich parts of the world is also something uh, that plays a big part of the story. Uh, it's also a uh, key for the visitors to put themselves in their own uh, and their own consuming patterns uh, in relation to what they meet in the exhibition. We all have a responsibility in how we do our shopping. This is a floor plan of the exhibition. It covers about 500 square meters. Um, in the central part of the room, we have built a symbolic factory. It's, it's this part here. Uh, and um, it frames and hearts the sort of uh, f frames the heart, heart of the exhibition. And uh, the walls are built out of expanded metal, which means that um, it gives a semi-see-through effect that uh, uh, makes it possible to keep a slight connection between the inside and outside of those walls. Uh, you can see them behind the neon signs there. Expanded metal. Uh, when you enter the exhibition, this is what you meet. 
Um, this neon signs give you the name of it all. Textile kraft means textile power. Uh, and those kind of signs were significant for the heyday of the textile industry um, of Borås and could be seen on most uh, factory walls at the time. Throughout the exhibition, the story is enhanced by design. Uh, at the entrance, you can see an introductory uh, film um, projected on these workers' uh, lockers, uh, for example. And we've tried to involve all senses. You get the smell of oil from the machines. You, uh, we use uh, sounds from the factory floor. Uh, we use a lot of pictures and film. Uh, and lighting is crucial as well to, to the experience of this exhibition. Like I said, um, we've built a symbolic factory and this is what you find inside. It's our textile machines from the 20th century, all in, in working condition. Uh, on these machines, our technicians can show the production line from uh, fibre to fabric. And if I say that we've got about 400 machines in our collection, you can uh, probably understand the that this process of, of deciding which ones to choose for the exhibition was a hard job for the technicians. Uh, they love them all, you see. <laughs> um, and uh, at times when the vis visitors can't um, experience a live guidance by, by the technicians, they have an opportunity to immerse themselves in the process and machines by using this uh, digital station loaded with information, uh, pictures, film and so on. So back to the floor plan. Um, the machines are in the middle, like I said, and around it we uh, tell the story uh, about uh, the textile industrial pros and cons, really. It's built around themes, uh, always reflecting on the uh, here and then and there and now narration. In the first theme, the visitors walk through a landscape changing from agricultural society uh, to uh, industrial, industrialization. So trees are replaced by chimneys and uh, uh, the differences bet between uh, pre- and post-industrialized society are huge and uh, change the conditions for how people live their lives, really. And that's what we were trying to, to do here. Moving on, the visitors will um, meet the, the power of innovation and technical uh, development. And Britain led this innovation. And when the methods of making what used to be made by hand mechanical, um, it wasn't hard to understand the potential in the trading possibilities that this uh, would mean. And uh, by putting an export ban on machines and drawings of machines, the government hoped to keep the new knowledge within the country. This was, of course, doomed to failure. And um, this is uh, a result of that, really. <laughs> it's uh, uh, the first machine that was uh, smuggled into Sweden. Uh, it was in the 1720s, and Spanish and smuggling um, was really a, um, an industry in itself. Uh, this actually was smuggled from Holland to, uh, to um, Sweden. The garment industry became huge after World War II, uh, and a vast number of seamstresses were required to satisfy demand. We had a huge influx of foreign labor, and uh, the industry thrived. The competition from abroad increased, though, and um, the garment industry moved on to other places uh, where manufacturing costs were lower. And this is something that goes on still today. The search for the least expensive seamstress still continues. And today, it's uh, the poorest parts of, of Africa that's locate, location for new, uh, new textile uh, industry. Uh, 
as you can see on the photos on the wall here, uh, the differences between 1960s Boros on the right and uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh in 2014 aren't that, that huge. Uh, the big difference, I would say, is that the pressure on, on those who make our clothes today is even harder. Um, I don't know if you can read on the sign, you can't. No. Um, she's got a sign just beside her saying that she hasn't lived up to the production target. Uh, so it's a sort of shaming method, I suppose. The next theme is set in a uh, shop environment. Grab a bargain, eh? <laughs> Uh, we buy clothes like we have never never done before. And the more we buy, the more are produced. Our overconsumption of clothes is far from sustainable and the low price we pay for a garment uh, is not a cost to us, but to, to those who are underpaid making them, of course. We have a lot of students coming to uh, our museum and this is really a part of the exhibition that gets them going. Um, it makes them reflect on their own part uh, in this sort of up, upside down world of, of textiles, uh, but also gives them an opportunity to uh, analyze and, and uh, think about what they can do about it, uh, what, what uh, each and every one can do. Like I said, the textile industry built welfare in Bros. We went from a poor country to a welfare state. Um, 100 years ago, though, um, the textile workers of Bros um, really struggled to uh, make enough for a living. And the similarities uh, to today um, are striking, like I said. Um, this is a copy of a real home of today. Uh, the original is found in Dhaka in Bangladesh uh, and home to, uh, home to a, a family of textile workers. You get huge areas uh, with sheds like this. And um, uh, here and then and there, are now, and there and now is, is sort of uh, coming back again. Uh, long work days. Low wages, poor housing, poor conditions for the children are some of the parallels that we see. But there is also a power and a will to change, and that's important to know. Um, slowly, this struggle bring, brings things to, do, to the better, and uh, uh, creating awareness of the situation for the people that makes, make our clothes today is, is one of the um, one of the important things that we want to lift in, in this exhibition. Another characteristic for textile industry that we just wouldn't see past is its history and ongoing problem as a polluter. Discharge like the one you can see behind the desk, the colours are really quite weird here, but... Um, uh, Discharge like that wouldn't be accepted in Sweden today. The picture is taken in Sweden, though, in the 70s. Um, and has, has given uh, Sweden the most polluted uh, waters downstream Boros uh, uh, because of the textile industry being so strong there. Uh, and like, like the rest of the large-scale industry, this problem has also been exported to other places. Uh, nowadays, though, it's uh, leaving even bigger problems behind because it's uh, polluting fresh water supplies for millions of people. To explain the complex world of textile industry uh, in a simple way, we've created a game that uh, the visitors can play on the actual floor. Pros and cons and the complex game of keeping a company profitable in a competitive uh, world gives the visitors the opportunity to reflect on, on these issues. The winner who first reaches the uh, director's chair behind the desk is met by a 
message saying congratulations, you are the most successful business manager, but did you play a fair game? The last stop of the exhibition um, brings hope of a better future to the visitors. Here we look at research and development uh, that strive to make textile industry better. As you can see on the de uh, design, it's uh, meant to look a bit futuristic, maybe a bit uh, like a lab or something. Uh, and in collaboration with the Academy, uh, we have a fantastic opportunity to show some of the ongoing uh, research that puts uh, Boros uh, in a good position internationally. And the projects we've chosen to, to show here are projects that, um, that give gives some keys to, to a solution to the problems that we've lifted in the rest of, of the exhibition. So the, the stride towards sustainability is, is sort of common to all these projects that we show. And again, the visitors get a chance to, to look at their own part in this. Uh, we have a, uh, a textile consumption test where the visitors can uh, answer 10 questions about their awareness and shopping patterns. And uh, by analysing the answers, they are given... Uh, tips on how to become more sustainable textile consumers, and a recipe, a receipt can can uh, can be printed that they can sort of bring to to uh, the next coming uh, shopping tour. The textile power exhibition was uh, awarded the most prestigious award you can get in Sweden for an exhibition uh, last year uh, and was awarded the exhibition of the year 2016. So we're really proud of that, of course. <laughs> and that uh, will end my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you for sharing with us your perspective on how to narrate textile legacies through, textile, uh, through exhibitions. So up next, we have Antonia Simon on stage. Antonia is the director of Australian Tapestry Workshop in Melbourne, which has an international reputation as a world leader in the creation of contemporary hand-woven tapestries. It is the only workshop of its kind in the country and one of the only handful in the world. Let's welcome Antonia to share more with us. Antonia, please. Thank you very much. And it's a very, very great honour for me to be asked to speak here at this chat seminar today. And I want to say thank you very much to all the wonderful chat team for making it possible for me to meet so many wonderful people with a shared passion for textiles. It's really exciting and the connections that uh, I've started making and hope to make as we continue are very, very exciting for us. I'm going to give you a very brief history of uh, the tapestry workshop, uh, why we developed tapestry in Australia, given it's the other side of the world from uh, the European tapestry tradition, how they're made at the tapestry workshop and our key tapestry projects to give you an insight into our work. And I also want to quickly run through what the challenges are in keeping our doors open. It's very, very hard uh, to keep tapestry workshops alive and thriving. You know, in the, in the medieval and, and renaissance period, there were hundreds and hundreds of tapestry workshops. Now there's a handful in the world. And as uh, someone said yesterday, we are an endangered species. So we're trying to make ourselves relevant in this contemporary art world of match, mass production uh, a global art world where we are so niche and um, very expensive because our work is so time consuming. Uh, we are housed in this lovely building in Melbourne which is a 19th century building that has always had a textile history. We're very proud to be able to continue this history. Uh, it was once a drapery and then a glove factory then a knitting mill so uh, we have 
worked in this incredibly flexible, beautiful space in South Melbourne, uh, where we get southern light from, the, which is for us is the soft light to work in, in this very flexible space. All of our all of our looms are beautifully engineered American looms by Shannock, and all of them except our really large one at the back are all movable. So we can. We can actually reconfigure the space very, very quickly for events, for talks, for uh, fundraising dinners and so on. So it's, it's a wonderful space. We can work on a number of different projects at any one time. So the Tapestry Workshop's been operating for 42 years and nine years ago we decided to change the name from the Victorian Tapestry Workshop to the Australian Tapestry Workshop to really reflect our national and international ambitions. Uh, the modus operandi of the Australian Tapestry Workshop is to work with uh, contemporary artists and architects and we want to seek, we really seek to challenge our weavers by providing stimulating and testing designs in a wide variety of mediums, uh, such as drawing, digital images, photography, painting, ceramic, watercolours and collage for example. Uh, it's an interesting model for us. We, uh, we are not well funded, say for example, like the Gobelin Tapestry Factory in France, which is fully funded by the government. We have about 20-25% of our funding from the state government and all the rest we have to raise through commissions and fundraising. So it's a great challenge for us to find tapestry commissions to sustain us uh, financially and artistically. So that's my job. That gives me sleepless nights. But I'll just run through how tapestries are woven. Each tapestry is unique. We do not do additions. And they're hand woven by a team of specialist weavers using the traditional gobelin technique. Uh, they are very time consuming and labor intensive and therefore very expensive. It's a very niche market, a very small market, and especially as we don't have a traditional a tradition of tapestry in Australia. However, we're working on that. So our challenge is to build new markets, to build reputation uh, for high quality tapestries, for innovative tapestries, and we also are trying very hard to push this as a very high point in an artist's career to work with us. Uh, we have these beautiful handmade bobbins. Uh, recycling is uh, a wonderful part of what we do and we've got this wonderful bobbin maker who finds lost pieces of wood either on the side of the road or in junk shops and he fashions these beautiful tooled bobbins for our weavers to use. Unlike our European colleagues, we use a little metal tip uh, which actually gives the weavers additional weight in uh, packing down their weft thread which actually is fantastic for saving their necks, their backs and uh, their shoulders from uh, wear and tear. Uh, these bobbins are all, all holding our yarns. Our weavers use from between 10 and 15 different colours on any one bobbin at any one time. Uh, all of these dyes are uh, woven, uh, sorry, are dyed in the Australian Tapestry Workshop. This is a, a small sample of our palette. Our weave, uh, weavers use a palette of 370 wool colours and 200 cotton colours. This is our dyer in our very modest colour laboratory. Uh, it's very, very small, but it does what we need to do in order to keep quality control over our materials. It's extremely important for us to have that quality control of it, the colours that we want and the quality of the yarn that we need and to have it um, as we need it. We use wool that is Australian wool and it's all sourced from farms where we can trace it back to the farms and the farms are concerned with in environmentally sustainable practices and humane animal practices which are all values that we want to be associated with. As part of the weaving process, a critically important part of our weaving process is once the design and the artist have been finalised, our weavers uh, start doing a whole series of experimental samples where they look at different warp settings, colour relationships, scales, textures and ways of translating the design into the medium of tapestry. They can also draw inspiration from our wonderful archive of every sample that we've woven on the on over 500 tapestries woven throughout our 42 year history. And here's our um, younger weaving interns uh, working on uh, the tapestry which is about to be finished next week, uh, looking at all the different warp sets and colour variations in order to be able to feed these back to the designer uh, so that they can settle on the shared vision. 
I'm now going, uh, this is, again, this is the uh, exchange, the really important in, uh, exchange uh, with our, uh, in this case, architect, uh, who is looking at the interpretation of the second Tapestry Design Prize for Architects that we have initiated, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit further on. Uh, Justin is an architect based in Singapore who is also a theatre designer, and he was the successful winner of our second prize. Uh, we operate with artists all around the world, and so this is where we can use the internet uh, very effectively, so we can actually have uh, ongoing, ongoing creative exchanges with, the, uh, with artists through Skype. So we, we're very traditional in many ways, but we do use modern technology when we can. So here, uh, our young weaver is looking at, she's actually making the, essentially making the cartoon. So she's, we, once we've got the design, and we tend to like to have a design which is much, much smaller, so that we can blow it up and that we have much more capacity for interpretation. Uh, so once the design's been settled on, we blow it up to scale, and then it is traced on mylar film, essentially, which is essentially a map of the key areas that we need to interpret on the tapestry. This is then uh, printed onto a uh, cartoon which hangs at the back of the tapestry loom. As you can see, the war the, there's a loom that has been warped up with cotton warp. Once upon a time, we had a very strong textile industry in Melbourne, and we used to be able to use Australian warp thread. Now that we ha now we have to source uh, Egyptian cottons from Sweden. So, uh, uh, so the the, the, lo the loom is warped up, and she's just uh, about to. And you can see the the bottom floor of the tapestry has already started. And here we have the tapestry underway. The design is on the right. Uh, interestingly, with colour printers and computers these days, we have found uh, that every computer is calibrated differently, every, every printer is, is calibrated differently. So now we ask the artist to, if they're working in a digital form, to actually print off the exact, uh, the exact print according to their colour palette because we did a whole range of samples for Justin, sent them off to Singapore, and then Justin decided that the palette was incorrect. So it took him seven goes to be able to get that tap the, the design on the right. We set out the palette of all our yarns um, on the floor, so the weavers are surrounded by their palette and can pull on, the, on all the colours that they need as they work. This is just going to run through some of our tapestries, some of our most significant tapestries. Can you all hear me at the back? Um, this is probably uh, our most notable tapestry. It's huge. This took 22,000 hours, which is essentially 11 weavers working for two years to be able to make this tapestry for the Great Hall of our new Parliament House in Canberra. Uh, artist Arthur Boyd created an artwork which would cover almost the entire south, south wall of the Great Reception Hall. Uh, Arthur Boyd had already been working uh, with tapestry in Europe because in the, in, uh, before, artists, before artists could work in Australia, they actually had to go to work in Europe, either at um, Aubusson or Beauvais or Gobelin or at uh, Port Alegre. So once the tapestry workshop started in 1976, people started to come to be able to work uh, with us. And this, we did this in our seventh year of operation. It's our magnus opus, and uh, it's a really extraordinary work. This, this is a tapestry that we're very honoured to have in Sydney's, Sydney's most iconic building, Australia's most iconic building, the Sydney Opera House. Uh, Jorn Utzen was asked by the, by the government to be involved in the refurbishment of the Opera House. The Opera House uh, saga ended very badly for Jorn Utzen. There was a, a, a breakdown of relations between the government, the government engineers and bean counters and Jorn Utzen and he went back to Sweden and the project was finished by another architect. Uh, so in the, the government was keen to re-engage Utzen and in the re-engagement process they asked him if he'd ever 
if he'd ever designed an artwork or ever wanted to design artwork for the building and he pulled out this tapestry design that he had under his bed. So we were extraordinarily honoured to be able to work with Jorn Utzon and his daughter in making this tapestry for the it's for the Opera House, which is now hanging in the Utzon Room in his honour. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, we were doing a lot of work in Singapore through a number of commissions. We've got a major commission in Singapore's Esplanade Theatres on the Bay, and this is a wonderful example of a project we did with Singaporean artist Eng Tao, which is hanging in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Singapore. This is a very, very challenging work that we did uh, in 1996 with a master printer, Ken Tyler, in New York, with the artist Frank Stella. This was a great challenge for us to be able to achieve this work because it was a, an extraordinary ir irregular shape and it was very, very multi-layered. And the samples that we kept from this particular project are of uh, great interest to any of the artists that we work with because they were able to show them the possibilities that are inherent in tapestry. This is another major project that we did with New Zealand artist Robert Ellis for the New Performing Arts Centre in Auckland in 1989, the Aotoa Tapestry. This is the single largest tapestry that the Australian Tapestry Workshop's ever done. It's 11.6 metres by 6.4 metres. The earlier work I showed you in Parliament House in Canberra for safety reasons uh, and for maintenance reasons was actually made in four different strips and velcroed together. So this, this particular project took six weavers nearly uh, two years to complete. This is, these are two beautiful works that we did with uh, Hong Kong born artist John Young. We've got a very rich collaboration with John. On the left is Open World, which was commissioned by the State Government of Victoria as a gift to the people of Nanjing in China, uh, as a relation, as to celebrate the sister city relationship and also to celebrate the, the new library in Nanjing. Uh, Open World was a turning point for the Australian Tapestry Workshop. It's the first time where the weavers faced the challenge of interpreting photography and digital imaging, imagery. And this was a really wonderful project for all of us. And when John was asked to join the second tapestry, Finding Kenneth Meyer, which was designed for the National Library of Australia, he threw out some particular challenges for our weavers uh, because he wanted, he knew that we were very good at creating layers of transparency in tapestries. And so he digitally overlaid three portraits of Kenneth Meyer, both as a young 13-year-old at his father's funeral, as a young navigator in the Navy in the Second World War, and as an older man. So John thinks that we rose to the challenge. And one beautiful example of having your own die on the premises is that we couldn't quite get the colour combination right for John. So finally he said, Japanese green tea, that's exactly the colour I want. So he went out and got some Japanese green tea and our dyer matched that colour perfectly. So that's become John Young's particular colour now. We want to focus very much on working with important and emerging contemporary artists, both to enhance our reputation as an exciting place to work and uh, also to extend artists' practice and to encourage them to discover tapestry as a fascin fascinating medium to work with. And in, in the late 2000s, we worked with David Noonan, who's a very exciting artist who lives and works in London. As you can see, these are very complex uh, digital images. He's got a great passion for theatre and film, as well as textiles. And in the left hand, tapestry, uh, you've got five or six different layers of imagery superimposed onto that. And when we received this image, we thought, my God, how are we possibly going to make that? But the weavers just analysed it and broke it down almost pixel by pixel, because a pixel essentially uh, uh, is equivalent to a weaving pass. So these were really, really wonderful, wonderful works uh, to, to be able to collaborate with David on. And on the, the right 
hand tapestry. This is a, a, a Japanese kabuki dancer, I think, putting on makeup, um, overlaid by a digital image of, of Boro fab fabric. And David was very, very keen to see how a recycled textile, which is then converted into a digital imagery, which is then digital image then turned into a design and then recreated as a textile would work and it's a credit to our skilled weavers that you can actually get that sense of frayed worn cloth in a f flat in this instance tapestry so they really did the most superb job in cleverly cleverly capturing capturing the layers textures and mood of David's beautiful works in order to build our profile nationally and internationally, because we're a very small arts organisation and we have a tiny weenie budget, uh, we've got a program of weaving tapestries designed by Indigenous artists uh, for our embassies and high commissions overseas. So this is the latest work that we've done. This is a work for Singapore and it's designed by Indigenous artist Brooke Andrew, who's the most extraordinary artist. He works across a whole range of mediums, and he is the next curator of the ne next artistic director of the Sydney Biennale. He was very keen to explore the notion of identity, uh, and as this was for Singapore, uh, the Singaporean High Commission said, "What is Singaporean identity? What do you what do you call it? Is it is it uh, Chinese? Is it Malay? Is it Indian? These are all three strong." Uh, strong groups within within Singapore. So he took that notion further and looked at uh, looked at identity, particularly through Australian Indigenous eyes. And he also wanted to create that sense of of mystery. And so he threw the challenge to us of making this two piece tapestry with this veil. Now, when Brooke has this extraordinary archive that he works through, largely photographic and also uh, archival materials. So he got this beautiful photograph of an unnamed indigenous uh, warrior, we think, from northern New South Wales in the 1890s. Uh, and he then prints these onto, with a, with a particular process using a silver ink, onto canvas. And in that process of transferring the image to canvas, there's a lot of creasing. And he was very keen for us to both recreate the creasing in the weaving, but also to, to have a very slight silvering, as you would with uh, old uh, archival photographs. And so we were experimenting with, a, with different threads on how, and, and how, to, how to get that sense, that very subtle sense. And what we ended up doing was a very mixed uh, polyester thread, and we used one strand of that in a in a bobbin of 10 different yarns just to get that st slight silvering. He wanted the tapestry to almost have a slight reflection as you moved past it. So what we did was we wove the, we wove the veil as a textile. We dyed woolen thread black, uh, essentially, and then we uh, wove almost, a, it was almost a, a cloth over the top and then sewed it in the top and then had the eye holes in there. It's interesting because I think the, I think the embassy staff find it a little bit disconcerting, whereas we adore it. But it was a wonderful challenge for us, and those are the challenges the weavers absolutely adore and respond to. This is another uh, really challenging tapestry. This, this is one we did several years ago with the uh, Turner Prize winner, Keith Tyson. And Keith said he did not see the tapestry process and his design are simply a diffusion of my painting but in a, a new way of making an object in its own right. The weaving together of various strands, the strata of compressed time forming slowly into an image, all for a perfect conceptual fit with the themes that I've always been fascinated with. So it really was an extraordinary tapestry. He wanted it to be three-dimensional, so we did that both visually through our complex colour shading and also by using Sumac, which is a supplementary uh, weft thread as well, to build up, build up uh, layers that you can see in the tapestry. This is another tapestry designed by uh, architect John Wardle, which was the winner of our first tapestry design prize for architects which was quite extraordinary. He called it 
perspex on a flat surface, so he was he was very interested in the sense of planes and light. And when our weavers found, uh, came to the design, they also encouraged him to sense, to give a sense of pixelation to the whole image to make it much more tactile, textile-like and really exciting. And, and so we experimented with that sense of pixelation because once you print that digital design onto paper, you do really get a really strong sense of pixels. So it was the most extraordinary tapestry. John twisted my arm very hard for a very long time to actually take the top of the tapestry up because it originally the design finished at the top of the diagonals and we realised that, of course, if we extended it by so, that you'd actually get a far greater sense of depth and we were actually able to do this within the budget constraints that we worked on. Once a tapestry is finished, we then get the key people involved in the tapestries, the designers and, in this case, uh, the person that commissioned the tapestry, which is a wonderful philanthropist and gallerist in Sydney called Judith Nielsen, who's got a very big collection of, of Chinese art and has a gallery specifically devoted to her collection. And she's now in the process of building yet another gallery and another performing art space in Sydney. So an extraordinary philanthropist and... The reason she was keen to commission this tapestry was that she said when her father was repatriated after the Second World War, he was repatriated to Egypt and he was taught tapestry weaving as a form of rehabilitation. So the tapestry weaving stayed with him as a particular passion all his life and this was really an homage to her father which was doubly special and it's also gone, in our, it's gone into a very important collection. So the tapestry is cut off and then we essentially finish the tapestry off by knotting it on, uh, knotting all those loose warp threads. We then uh, make a hem, then we put on, a, we put on the hang a hanging system, we give it a conservation lining and it's free to go off to its new life uh, in a new world. Another work we did uh, was with artist Janet Lawrence, who's very involved with environmental concerns. She works all over the world, and they're essentially sculptures and installations that she works, works with and, and the photographic process. And Janet and I had long wanted to work together, and this was a very special private commission for, uh, for a very philanthropic family with a great interest in art. And here you can see how the tapestry medium is quite extraordinary for translating that sense of transparency and layering that you can get in photographs, which is essentially photographs on glass, which is largely how she works. So it's got that wonderful feeling of being ambiguous, whether it's actually underwater or if it's in a, a rainforest environment. So this was a very special work for us. This is another work that we've recently finished. Uh, which is by the artist Guan Wei, who works between Sydney and uh, Sydney and uh, Beijing, and I'll just have to move on quite quickly here because I'm running behind. And this is an example of just how we use different warp sets to get a, a range of uh, of uh, a range of uh, textures and dimensions. Now, tapestry workshop, how do we make it? How do we ensure that it survives into the future? Firstly, we've got a Chain, uh, we've got to pass on the skills from a new generation to a new generation of weavers. Most of our weavers are starting to retire. They're about 30, 30 years experience among, uh, with each of them. They're highly skilled and we need to pass that on to a new generation. So we recently had a program where we advertised for interns. We were overwhelmed about how many people wanted to work in tapestry and it goes to reflect, I think, that, that a passion worldwide about re-engaging with textiles in a very tangible and material way. So this is our young interns working, and we've now got one intern working with us full time, which is, well, she's now graduated, she's working with us full time. Uh, we try and have a very vibrant art, artist in residence program. Uh, we've formalised this about five years ago, and we've got artists from all over the world coming to work with us. My challenge now is to find money so that the artists from internationally can come and stay with them at the moment. We just embed them in our studio, and they can work with us in whatever way they want to. So if you know anyone that wants to go, wants to come and work with us, we'd love to have them. 
but we have buto dancers, we have performance artists, we have cer ceramicists. We, we're happy to work with any creative people in any form. It's about en encouraging that creative collaboration and crossover. I'll race through now, sorry. Uh, again, we have a whole series of exhibitions that we try and do. Uh, this is a, a one that we run every two years, which is an international exhibition uh, for both for senior textile artists and for emerging artists. So we just want small tapestries that will fit in the post. And it's wonderful being able to survey textile practice from around the world. We run a whole series of weaving courses. And again, the interest in these um, has really expanded in the last few years. And we'll, we'll do these weaving courses for a range of different skill levels. Uh, we'll run a whole series of open events, uh, on, such as uh, we do, we, sometimes we open on weekends so that uh, people can get access to us where they normally wouldn't. We run children's classes, for example, children's weaving classes, which are, we just tried as an experiment and they've been extraordinarily popular. And it's a wonderful way of engaging people and, t and teaching them about tapestry. Uh, just to health and well-being. We've just started, uh, over the last five years, started using weaving in hospitals as a, a therapeutic program, working with... Uh, mothers that have experiment or mothers to be that have uh, very problematic pregnancies and are bored and worried and they need stimulation and creativity in their hospital beds with small children that are very very sick with cancer patients with people that have to be on dialysis for hours at a time hooked up to a dialysis machine and this has proved extraordinarily successful because this is wonderful creative engagement for people and I think the therapeutic uh, world of the arts um, has, uh, the value of the arts has been well demonstrated. Again, um, we have uh, a series of exhibitions around themes, maybe Asia Pacific Theatre of Performing Arts that we do every couple of years. We are very keen to be a part of that. We have, we, every few years we get distinguished artists and um, curators and so on to come and work with us and this was a wonderful, wonderful session that we had with Reiko Sudo where Reiko not only did a sell-out talk which was well attended by people from around Australia but also this magnificent exhibition and a pop-up shop and a series of workshops. So we're very keen to make links out into the world to try and encourage creative exchange. Tapestry Design Prize for Architects. My former chairman was an architect and we were looking at ways to engage uh, new business essentially to stay afloat and a wonderful way to engage artists and uh, building developers was to do a Tapestry Design Prize for Architect and where else to launch it but Sydney in front of the Utsun Tapestry. This has proved amazingly popular as we have partnered with the main architectural publisher in Sydney and oh, in Australia and we've really had amazing international response for that. Uh, we run an exhibition around the winners as you can see here and you can see the winner of the second prize and, uh, and we are starting to tour these exhibitions. This is the, you can't see them all on the second story but it was uh, absolutely packed out so we were all terribly excited that this is actually starting to uh, get international uh, traction. Fundraising is a critically important part of what we do and friend raising. Because so much of our income has to be uh, sourced ourselves, we've started doing friend raising dinners in our space. They've never been done before, but we just move, move the looms around and people ac actually sit face to face with the tapestries and the weavers and the artists. And it's a, it's a very exciting and it's proved very, uh, very uh, positive for us and very beneficial. Uh, we'll often get donations as, fr uh, um, as a result of that or uh, we are starting to get uh, interest in business. So we're really having to think as laterally as we can and be very nimble on our feet. Uh, we're also we're engaging social media as much as we can. Uh, we've got uh, Instagram following is, and uh, Facebook followings are increasing. We're about to launch a new website. I was hoping it would be done in time for uh, this weekend, but that was not to be. Websites always take longer than one thinks. Uh, and we changed our name, as I said before, from the Australian Tapestry Workshop uh, from the Victorian Tapestry Workshop. We've got copies of our Lotus magazine woven out, up the back there for all of you to take home. Uh, we only put out one a year because the, the work that we do is very, very slow. 
So uh, you'll see a, a year's worth of work encapsulated in our magazine. We've published this, we've published a number of books, but this is the book we published to, uh, to turn 40, and I'm just going to race ahead. We've got a tiny video here. Have I got time to do the video? Just a quick, oh, that's not it. Is there a video there? Just to give you a very quick idea of the weaving process and the, the workshop floor. Sorry to gallop through the Australian Tapestry Workshop. I will. I just wanted to give you a potted overview of what we do and how we try and keep an ancient art form alive and relevant in this common day and age. It's it's hard, but it's also extremely exciting. And the more we keep doing this, the more we're meeting with and working with extraordinary people. That's it. Thank you, Antonia. So now we're going to have a very short uh, coffee break. Um, we have prepared some memo at the mushroom table on the back, as you can see. So if you have any questions to our speakers, please fill one, and then you can put it on the whiteboard.